All right, everybody. I think you can see me. I think. Give me one right, second while everybody. I set everything up. Sorry about all the extra noise you're hearing. That's dogs. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, please let me know in the comments section if there is <clears throat> anything that you need me to do differently. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, but I'll just go ahead and get started. So if you get on here and you can hear me okay, please let me know. Um, leave a comment so I know uh, what to do differently because it's my first time doing this. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start with um, one of the questions. So let's see. Kelly from period two is asking, uh, what's, what's random and what's non-random in evolution? And uh, it's a really good question. So... When it comes to the randomness of evolution, I want you to think about uh, natural selection. Is it random and or is it not? So we all know that genetic drift is random. And we know that genetic drift is sort of an umbrella term for uh, a lot of other things like the bottleneck effect or like the founder effect. So a couple years ago, a student asked the question of, so why isn't natural selection random too? And natural selection is not random because the organisms that survive aren't randomly surviving. They're surviving because they are more fit than other organisms depending on that environment. So know that natural selection <clears throat> is a non-random part of evolution uh, and that genetic drift is a random part of evolution. So evolution really does have random and non-random components to it. Okay. Check the picture, make sure it's all working out okay. Hopefully you can see me all right. Okay. So another question is, uh, how can you describe mechanisms like mimicry and camouflage without sounding like Lamarck or without sounding Lamarckian? So <clears throat> I think, first of all, it's important to distinguish between mimicry and uh, camouflage. So I know this was one of our temp check questions about, you know, which one of the following are mimicry and which one are camouflage. So Mimicry really has to do with an organism mimicking something and in a way almost wanting to be seen. So one of the examples was about, uh, I think, a kind of fish that basically creates these waves that make it so that other fish sort of come around. So it wants the effects of its action to be seen. Uh, whereas camouflage, really, you're trying to kind of um, almost blend with the, with the background, blend with the environment so that you're not seen. So I guess a good rule of thumb would be this idea of does the organism, is it trying to sort of, not trying to, because that sounds Lamarckian within itself, but is the organism seen or is it doing something that's causing some kind of effect? So uh, think about the zebra example. So uh, zebras, what's the deal with having their stripes when there's a bunch of them, there's a huge pack of them. Uh, what's the benefit of having those stripes? And the benefit is that each individual zebra uh, has a lesser chance of being seen by predators. Okay, <clears throat> so going back to Kelly's question about <clears throat> how can you describe them without sounding Lamarckian. So let's think about an organism that say, I don't know, let's talk about zebras, I guess. So how is it that they got their stripes? It's not just that they wanted to be able to blend in with other zebras, right? So it's this idea that, you know, going back to this, so there was uh, variation among zebras in the beginning that had stripes and maybe more stripes or less stripes, different types of stripes maybe, uh, and think about what that variation, where it comes from, right? So that's where we want you to talk about mutations and crossing over or genetic recombination. So then what happened? How is it that the zebra ended up having um, all these marks or all these stripes on it? And the reason is because the zebra basically 
it was beneficial for it to have these marks, right? It didn't think about, oh, I should have these marks because it's going to help me out. So um, these marks continued because the zebras that had these stripes were able to survive uh, at a higher rate. So they were considered more fit um, and they were able to reproduce. And so those genes get passed on, those traits get passed on, and therefore you end up having zebras that look the way that they do today. So I love this question uh, from Kelly, and I hope I was able to describe it okay. If I was not, please let me know, and I'm happy to go over it again. Uh, the next question is from Arjun. What is the definition of speciation? Uh, the definition is basically um, for a species to sort of, and I guess I'll, I'll use this, but it kind of forks off into two different species. <clears throat> and it could happen for a number of reasons, but uh, you know, we talked about geographic isolation. We talked about the different types of isolation that would lead to reproductive isolation. So um, the definition of speciation, uh, for, for example, would be that a species, for whatever reason, um, is separated into two different species. And so when I, when I think of speciation, I think of this sort of, they're going off to different directions. Um, and that's where I would wanna talk a little bit about divergent and convergent evolution. So I guess I'll talk about that now. So divergent evolution versus convergent evolution. <clears throat> I want you to think about the word diverge to sort of go different directions, just like what we talked about with speciation. So divergent evolution is this idea that a species for some reason, so let's say there is a um, geographic isolation event and it just basically isolates them and they kind of go different directions over many generations, over a long period of time. Uh, eventually, we know that that those species event in the beginning had an ancestor. So that ancestor basically had certain parts, certain features, certain traits. So in the two new species, they may share certain traits with each other and you know, when you think about, for example, the hip bone of humans and the hip bone of whales, right? Or when you think about our tailbone and species that do have tails, uh, it's this idea that because we have a common ancestor, we still have the same, for example, bone structure. So when we talk about divergent evolution, we're talking about homologous structures. So the hip bone of humans or the hip bone of whales would be homologous structures, whereas something like the Think about a fly versus a bird, whatever kind of bird. So they both fly, they both have wings. So what's the deal with that? So it's this idea of convergent evolution. You gotta be careful here because convergent doesn't mean you have two species that become one. That's not the case at all. It's two species that for different reasons, could be environmental reasons, they start to kind of do similar things. So flies and birds, they both fly, they both have wings, but those wings have nothing in common with each other as far as an ancestor goes. So I wanted to clarify that. And those traits is what we call analogous structures or analogous traits. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Um, how is the appendix not a vestigial structure? So it, it actually has been considered a vestigial structure at some points. We know that the appendix does play a role in immunity. Um, it does raise your immunity or uh, boost your immunity, but you could be just fine without an appendix. So. Um, I would say, yeah, it's not a vestigial structure because it does have a function, but could you live without it? Yes, you could, okay? And the next question was, what is its use in the human body? And I just answered that one. Uh, next one, how can you tell if a population has speciated or just developed adaptations? That's a great question, okay. So if you want to compare sort of two species and be able to figure out if there is an, if there has been a speciation event, you basically can figure out if those species can mate with each other anymore. If they can mate and have viable offspring, then yeah, they have not speciated. If they cannot mate, and by that I mean if they can't have offspring, then there has been a speciation event. <clears throat> Next question is, what is the difference between mimicry and camouflage? And we were just talking about that. So if you feel like you need, um, you need me to cover that more, I'd be happy to come back to it and cover that a little more. Okay, so someone asks, um, I don't understand the difference between directional stabilizing and disruptive selection. Okay, so let's think about, and I have my whiteboard here. So let's make sure that I'm able to draw this and that you are able to see it. Okay, so there are three different types of selection when we talk about sort of stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. So I'm gonna draw one of them here. 
I'm going to hold this in front of me so that you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. So this is my graph. Um, let's say that we're talking about um, a type of species. And let's just say here is where we have the big kind for B, medium kind, and the small kind of that sort of uh, population. So in a population where the medium ones are doing really well, our graph is going to look like that. And that's known as stabilizing selection. OK? It's a situation where the intermediate in a population is doing really well. So if we're talking about beak size, maybe we have small beaks, medium beaks, and long beaks. Uh, this would be the medium beaks doing really well, uh, having, a, I guess, a higher frequency of, of their alleles in the population. The next one, again, going with big, medium, and small. This next one would look something like this. And that's basically the opposite of what I just drew. So this one, again, is stabilizing, stab, stabilizing, OK? This one is disruptive. So in this one, we're basically talking about the two uh, extremes, if you want to call them that, the two extremes doing really well and the intermediate type not doing well at all, OK? And then our last one, last but not least, this one kind of looks, this one is the hardest one to understand, and I'll explain to you why that is. OK? So it looks something like that. OK? So the dotted lines basically go to show that it can shift from one to another. So the, this one, this is known as directional selection. With directional selection, you basically have one of the extremes um, doing really well. Right, the intermediate's not doing well, the other extreme is not doing well. So in this situation, since we call them big, medium, and small, which one do you think is doing well? Right? Right here. That's our small one. That's the one that's that's the most successful. Okay. I hope that explanation helps. So um, I don't understand genetic drift and the concept of it. Okay, so genetic drift is this idea that things happen in evolution, sometimes due to chance. There's no rhyme or reason behind it. It just happens. So think about a group of bugs that get squashed because a tree branch drops on them. They didn't get, they didn't die. They didn't get squashed and die because they were less fit. They got squashed because that's where they were at the time. So it's kind of like, you know, bad timing, bad place. So genetic drift really has to do with this idea of chance, or I don't want to necessarily call it luck, but it's this idea that it happened because no reason. They, it didn't happen because they were more or less fit. OK? All right, let's keep moving. OK, so I don't understand most of Lamarck's ideas and which count as his. OK, so let's think of it this way. Lamarck's ideas really are two ideas that we should really think about. Well, maybe three. So it's this idea of use and disuse. So the idea that if you use something, if a bird uses its wings a lot um, over a long period of time, its, its, wings, might act, its wings might actually get larger, um, more powerful, not just in that individual bird, but over a long period of time, perhaps. Uh, the other idea is acquired traits. So it's this idea that if that bird's if that bird really develops large wings, that it's going to pass on those genes uh, to its offspring. Okay, and that's acquired traits. Uh, and then lastly, Lamarck talked about um, organisms becoming more complex through time and becoming more perfect. And we know that it doesn't really have to do with being more complex and perfect. It has to do with how those organisms can basically respond, how a population can respond to the environment that it's living in. So those are really the three main ideas that you want to take away from Lamarck. And you got to make sure that with your A-level question, <clears throat> that it is not, that it doesn't sound Lamarckian. Um, and I think once, once we practice it in class today, hopefully you have a better sense of what to write for your VIST or your A-level practice or A-level question. Okay. The next one is, what is coevolution? Great question. So coevolution is this idea that two um, species are evolving in response to each other. 
right? So you think about uh, bees and flowers, for example. If a group of bees, a population of bees is going more for a certain type of flower, what's going on with that flower, right? Why, first of all, why is that happening? Which flowers are going to be able to pass on their genes, their traits the most? It's the ones that the bees are going to the most. So the flowers are basically moving a certain direction because of the bees, and they're sort of impacting each other's evolution. So that's the idea of co-evolution. It's, it's when you have two different species that are not necessarily helping, I wouldn't say helping, but they're impacting each other's evolution. Okay. <clears throat> So this one asks, what are the effects of solution? But I'm not sure what that means, so I'm going to move on. Um, definition of evolution based on alleles. So that's a great question. I would say it really has to do with the change of the frequency of alleles in a population uh, over generations. Depending on what's going on in the environment, I didn't really talk about selection a whole lot, and you, but you know that you got to talk about uh, selection when it comes to this. What are examples of microevolution and macroevolution? Okay, so microevolution has to do with small changes in a population over a long period of time. So uh, let's think about the cormorants that we talked about, the flightless birds uh, example in class. So over a long period of time, they because remember they had gotten to the Galapagos Islands three and a half million years ago. So over those three and a half million years, when we look at them now. They are unable to fly, but they still have those wings. That is an example of a microevolutionary change. Right? The species is still the same, but uh, it's it's got something different about it. A macroevolutionary change would be something huge, something much bigger than just kind of your wings. Um, <clears throat> and I guess we can come back to that and talk about macroevolution. I know we didn't talk about it a whole lot in class. What does natural selection determine about the next generation of species? <clears throat> I think natural selection, think of it as it's, it's different things that nature throws at us or th throws at whatever population we're talking about. So if we're talking about a population of birds or ants, you think about you know how are they going to be any different? I would say it depends on what happens in their environment. So is their environment going to be something um, that's going to cause some variation in that population to succeed, to survive and reproduce? Um, is there going to be a selection for? Is there going to be a selection against? So that's really what it comes down to. And again, if, if my answers are not meeting your expectations, please let me know so I can <clears throat> find a different way to explain them. How does convergent evolution result in analogous structures? We covered that one. So again, let me know if you need to come back to that. Coevolution. So we just talked about that one. What is its importance? The importance of coevolution is that <clears throat> what's really cool about it is you have two different species that are evolving, but they're evolving um, not because of each other, but they're really impacting each other. So again, going back to our example of uh, bees and flowers, it is so cool that a type of flower could continue to survive and reproduce because of what the bees are doing and vice versa. Okay. <clears throat> Someone asked about <clears throat> genetic equilibrium. Okay, so you got to remember the five different things with genetic equilibrium. So first of all, I will tell you this, and you know this already, but it is impossible to reach genetic equilibrium. It is a uh, theoretical state, right? It's something that the way we talked about it, I someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, so why do we even talk about it if it doesn't exist? And my answer was because then you get to see that evolution is always taking place, right? Because in order for evolution to not take place, you have to reach genetic equilibrium. And we know that we can't reach genetic equilibrium. One of the examples is this idea of random mating. You have to have random mating take place in a population. And we don't mate randomly. We all have a set of criteria, um, not just us, but I mean, you look at birds and how they choose their mates. And some of you have seen the, the, the dance that I think we looked at once in class. Um, and how they can actually be picky. So they're not randomly choosing their mates. They're actually putting effort um, and some kind of thought into choosing their mates. Um, you look at other things like no mutations in a population. How can there be no mutations in a population? You look at things like large population, not always the case. 
no immigration, no immigration, right? Just some of these examples. How can you possibly prevent um, immigration and immigration out of a population? So all those, all of those things have to be true, basically, for genetic equilibrium to take place, and that just can't happen. So someone asks, uh, what is the difference between bottleneck and founder effect? Um, so bottleneck effect, okay, so think of it this way. <clears throat> I have this awesome bottle with me. Imagine if I drank all of this coconut juice in here, coconut water in here, and I filled it up with tiny little balls, little marble balls. <clears throat> and I and they were all different colors. Let's say I had 10 different colors in there, and there was an equal amount of each. So let's just say I threw in 25 little red balls, 25 little green balls, and so on and so forth. And then I gave you this bottle, and I told you that you have five seconds to get all of as many of the balls out of here as you can. And you did that, you'd probably maybe get something like, I don't know, 10 or 15 of them out. It's not likely, it's pretty likely that you would not get the same exact numbers of each one. It's even possible that you may not have any more green balls left in there or any more red balls left in there. That's this idea of the bottleneck effect, right? So think of it as this is the bottleneck and it prevents all of those balls from being able to be dumped outside of that bottle. The other one is the founder effect. And that's this idea that a uh, few members of a population can actually sort of maybe go off and start an, a new population and that those members who are starting that new population don't necessarily represent, they're not an accurate representation of all the alleles in that original population. So that's the difference between bottleneck and founder effect. Okay, gonna keep moving. <clears throat> okay, someone asked about horizontal gene transfer. So horizontal gene, tr gene transfer, to kind of put it in basic language, is this idea that bacteria can actually share their genes with each other, right? So if there's a bacterium that um, is resistant to something and that bacterium is able to sort of pair up with another bacterium, they're able to pass on their genes to one another. And now this one and this one shares some of the same genes. And so now they go off and do their own thing. But that idea is horizontal gene transfer. So as you know, bacteria are asexual and they um, you don't need two bacteria for, for them to reproduce. So that one bacterium can reproduce on its own. And there's no genetic, um, there's no, I guess, crossing over right? There's no genetic recombination for any of that. So the one way that bacteria have to still be able to uh, share DNA with each other is horizontal gene transfer. And that's the opposite of vertical gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer has to do basically with this idea that parents give it to their offspring and whatnot. Horizontal is two organisms giving it to each other. Okay. Moving on. What is the difference between divergent and convergent evolution? We went over that one already. So if you've missed that one, go back to the beginning of this video. All right. Can two species converge into one? I love this question. Um, it's this idea that, and we talked about this earlier. If you have two species, right, you can have convergent evolution, which means that they're sort of coming together in a sense, but they're not going to be one species, right? It's this idea that their environments are causing them to do similar things or to have similar traits, but they're not gonna come together and become one species. Okay, <clears throat> could there be more explanations of divergent and convergent evolution? This is a popular topic. I hope I've been able to explain it well. If not, please let me know, and I would be happy to go over it, go 